roll. You all ready? Yeah? Yeah. As ready as we <laughs> Okay, well, hello everyone. Welcome to the White Oak Basket Gathering, Reaching Beyond Traditions. We're so, so excited to have this wonderful audience with us today. We have an amazing, amazing program set for you today and for this weekend. There's just some really, really lovely talent in and around this area, and we're so excited that you all will be able to hear them and hear their traditions and all of the wonderful things. Um, my name is Camille Maria Acosta. I'm the Folklife Specialist with the Kentucky Folklife Program. I'm here representing the Folklife Program, but also representing Brent Bjorkman, who's the director of the Kentucky Folklife Program. He's in Sweden, flying over here immediately, mm -hmm. so he can be with you all tomorrow morning. <laughs> um, he's spreading the wonderful world of folklore and tradition um, internationally, because he's very cool like that. So he'll be here tomorrow to speak more. Um, but yes, we're so thankful um, that the White Oak Basket organization is here with us and all of the wonderful people, and we're so excited that you all are here today too. Um, just a little bit before I introduce the wonderful people to my left, um, the Kentucky Folklife Program prides itself in celebrating, preserving, conserving, presenting all of the wonderful cultural traditions in and around Kentucky. Um, we're so proud of it, we're so excited of the artists that we get to talk to and display and support and present um, for the community and beyond. So we're so, so excited that you all are here. Um, and I am learning along just with you all about the wonderful traditions of basket making. Um, I'm so excited to learn with you all. It's gonna be a really great weekend. Um, yes, so before I go any further, um, I'd love to introduce you the wonderful artist that I have to the left of me. Um, we, in the middle, we have the wonderful Sue Williams. Woo! <laughs> to the far left of me, we have Bill Smith. And right next to me, we have Scott Gilbert. Woo! Yay! And the narrative stage for this hour is all about tradition bearers. Now, tradition bearers discuss the basket maker's unique stories of encountering and becoming involved in the art of basket making and their roles in maintaining the traditions of their regions, comparing their methods and their materials. So we're gonna be talking about all things basket making, cultural traditions, and what exactly is tradition. So I'm very excited for this. Um, just because I wanna speak so highly of these people, I'm gonna go ahead and read a little bio of each, of each artist. Um, the wonderful Sue Williams is a master basket maker, award winner, and teacher from Morrison, Tennessee. Williams will present on her role in the White Oak community, including learning from local and Appalachian regional artisans, teaching at regional schools, and the role of fellowships in promoting basket making. Scott Gilbert studied basket making with Ollie and Lestel Childress, generational White Oak basket makers from Park City, Kentucky. He began teaching workshops in 1984 and continues passing on traditions today as webmaster, photographer, and artisan for the Basket Makers Catalog in Scottsville, Kentucky, and with the Mammoth Cave Basket Makers Guild in Hart County. Gilbert will speak about this role in the community and maintaining basket making traditions throughout the southeastern United States. And then last but certainly not least, we have Bill Smith, has been learning all about White Oak combing his local area for the best trees available and prepping weaving materials for, for well over 25 years. Currently residing on the coast of North Carolina, Smith was a resident basket maker at Tannehill Historical State Park for over 15 years and previously taught at John Campbell Folk School for 20 years. Bill also taught at Aramount School of Arts and Crafts and the Alabama Folk School on numerous occasions before retiring from the public teaching world in 2020. Bill works in tandem with his wonderful wife, Mary Ann Smith, in carrying on the Alabama tradition learned from their mentor and basket-making great, Jesse Thompson. As a presenter, Bill will discuss his role in the White Oak basket community, including knowledge sharing and marketing of his work. So clearly, we have some very talented, very passionate individuals with us, and I'm so excited that we all get to hear what they have to say. So, we're gonna go down the line, but of course, if anybody has any questions or things that you all would like to say in tandem, feel free to say it, feel free to shout it out. By all means, there's no rules to this, so we're very excited, and we will hold questions from the audience towards the very end, if that's cool with everyone. Alrighty, so we can start from left to right, right to left, or whoever feels like they wanna speak first. Okay, we're gonna start with Scott Gilbert. Uh, well, being a tradition bearer, Bearer is a uh, 
not something I've ever thought about. Uh, the minute I started making baskets, it was a way to do something to make money to survive. Just turn it off the fan. Oh, okay. So, uh, but it, but, but we've been doing this since about eighty, what eighty three, and so over the years we've taught hundreds of people how to wait, how to make white oak baskets, uh, and how to, uh, and, and we're still making baskets, uh, but we're still making stuff to make a living. So this has all been for me mostly economic, <laughs> and uh, if you go back in time, the children says that we learned from, who were fifth generation basket makers. They made baskets to sell on the, the stands on 31W. So it's economic. Uh, and at one time, there's 400 families in that, uh, Hart County making baskets in the 50s. And again, it was a way to make money. Ollie Childress told us one time, if we didn't grow it or make it, we didn't have it. Hmm. And so if they needed a basket, they made it. They found out they could make baskets, sell it at the souvenir stands. that used to be all up and down 31 to the... the We'll quote Yankees coming down to go to Mammoth Cave, and a, a few other people. <laughs> uh, Ollie would send her daughters out, wearing, being barefoot, wearing calico dresses, to go wait on the, the tourists. And she said that's that worked every time. The tourists would always buy something. <laughs> so, for as a tradition bearer, I guess I am now. But you are. started off, started out. It was the, the furthest thing from my mind. Mm -hmm. It was something to do, and we've kept it up and gotten better. And it's still a challenge. Sure. Every time you make a basket, get into a tree, you're learning all over again of what can this tree do and what can you do. Yeah. And I'm always trying to do something different. So it gets the, my baskets kind of get wonky sometimes, but that's kind of fun too. Well, before you even continue to, Scott, I think you mentioned a lot of wonderful things. I'm curious, just from the audience, what does tradition mean? It's a really complicated term, it's I think. A it's a lifestyle. It's a lifestyle. A lifestyle. Well, in the, in the academic world, uh, I've learned this from my wife, Beth, the tradition the, the, the traditional people learn usually from their family members. Since my family did not make white oak baskets, technically I didn't learn in the traditional manner, even though we learned from traditional basket makers. That's kind of a fine line. Uh, I don't know if that helps or not. But, uh. Yeah, yeah, it does. It's something you care so much about, passionate about, that passes on from generation to generation. And this can be, and you know, I, I can correct myself too, sometimes they're not necessarily things you're passionate about, just things that get passed down to you. Stories, food ways, recipes, cultural tradition, like there's so many different things that get passed down to you. And I think that's really cool that you didn't intentionally be like, oh, this is, ex you know, I'm gonna be passing this down, you know, all of these, yeah. all of these generations. But you already have as soon as you picked up your first basket and your first splint. That's well, I was in the flea market in Nashville probably in 81 or 82, and it might have been Earlene Thomas. She was set up. I didn't know who it was at the time, and she had all these wonderful baskets. And I says, that looks easy. I think I can do that. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was thinking in my mind. Then, That's what everybody thinks. Yeah. And then uh, uh, Beth got a book from the library, uh, Roy Underhill's uh, working whatever that uh, wood shop book. And had a chapter on white oak basket making from somebody I think from the Williamsburg, uh, Virginia area, and so I said, "Oh, okay." So we went down and cut down a, a tree, and it was a dead tree, so it was really hard to split that tree. But we actually made a really rough basket. And then very soon after that, we met all the Lester children. They were at the old Bowling Green Mall set up, and uh, we started talking to them, and they just said, "Come by, you just stop by, and we'll, we'll show you whatever." And so for a whole year, about every other week, I'd go up there and we'd sit in their living room or in the kitchen, uh, and the, the splits would be in the, the rinse water for the dishes, from the breakfast dishes, and, and the Lester would be running splits, and I'll be carving ribs, and it all. And it took me about a year going up there every two weeks and going home and working before I figured out how white oak worked. So I'm, I'm a real slow learner every day. <laughs> but uh, but it's it's a it's a real it's a. Because the old-time teachers, they don't really teach you; they just do, and they show. You, I used to watch Lestel's hands, just say, "Okay, what does he do?" And I got to figure this out. Mm -hmm. And so, little by little, with uh, pr persistence, practice. practice, yeah, all things happen good for, with practice. I was able to figure out how to do this. Then my baskets got better and better and better. And some of the early ones were pr pr pretty bad. <laughs> That's <laughs> but, called tradition. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can make them rough on purpose, right? Yeah. Well, Lestel's brother, George, you know, they were fifth generation basket makers. He made rough baskets, because that's what they used to make, field baskets. And Lestel got better and better and better, and he could charge more money for them. 
So his baskets got much more, much better as his prices went up. Right. And this was all during the 1980s. And they were in the first crafts marketing program with uh, Phyllis George Brown. Gotcha. And we were in the second year, got it juried into that. And uh, then you meet all these other craftspeople and you realize there is an excellence that's going out there and you gotta, everybody's got to step up their game mm -hmm. in order not to compete, but just to be at that level. And so even now, I'm still striving every time you make a basket to do the best you can and, uh, and work with what the tree gives you. Well, I'm gonna throw it on over to Bill. I'm interested, Bill, when did you first start basket making? Well, we first started probably in the 70s. Uh, yeah. We were originally from North Carolina near the coast and uh, I worked in construction and moved away me and my wife for 50 years, but we was living in Ohio at that time and somewhere in the early 70s, we went back to our hometown of Kinston and we both took a, a basket class out of Reed. And uh, it, it started out with that, but then uh, I, I'd say my, my wife was more involved when I wasn't away. She wanted to, to, to learn how to do it from tradition, from the stars, you know. But uh, so uh, in, in 88, we moved to Alabama, and it took us about two years to finally find somebody that would work with us. And we went to a lot of different, and at that time, most of the people that we went to to, to help us learn how to do it were older people. And, uh, and the reason why they wouldn't help us to start with, it, it came to me a little bit later on, is most people at that time, they knew that you weren't going to keep it up. So they figured, why would I want to waste my time teaching you something that I know good and well you're not going to do it because all the past experience, they, you know, they just, it just doesn't, it's too hard, you know. And, but, uh, so in 88, we uh, looked up and found uh, a person that uh, was willing to uh, teach us, and uh, it was at a festival. And me and Mary sat there and talked to them for a couple hours, and when everybody left that even, uh, we asked them, would he be willing to, to teach us how? So he gave us a little piece of wood, probably about a half inch wide and maybe about three foot long, and said, go home and make a basket. And he figured that'd be the end of us. <laughs> well, we went home, there was just enough of that piece of wood to make like a six inch square basket. And it wasn't enough to fill the whole basket in. It was just a, enough to have a few ribs and a weaver's but when we carried it back to him, he could see that we was interested. And he just lived about a half an hour from where we did. Right. And uh, he was uh, a wonderful <coughs> person to work with. But uh, when I think about traditional baskets, get back on that subject, uh, traditional is wherever you add in the world whether it's this country or whatever country, and I'm mainly going back 50 or 100 years back where if you wanted to carry something or you wanted to use something, you had to have a basket or some kind of container. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't have paper bags, plastic bags back then. So if you wanted to carry something, you made a basket. And what was traditional, in my way of looking at it is, wherever you was from, but no matter what part of the world, there was some material there that was plentiful in that area. And it just so happened in the eastern part of the United States, it was a white oak. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and originally, when uh, the basket making sort of got common is every community had a blacksmith, had a carpenter, and they had a basket maker. Because you had to have a container to carry and do the things you wanted to do. And uh, we, have, we have learned that uh, back in that period of time, the baskets were made crude. They didn't care what they looked like. <laughs> they, they most of the time didn't, didn't last for a year or two. You know, they'd leave them out in the weather, but the next year, they would make another one. You know. right. And one of the other uh, people we met in Alabama, 
uh, it was a, a black gentleman, and when we met him, he was probably in his 80s, and he talked about uh, how his family made baskets. And back then, it's hard to believe, you know, this, this would have been maybe in the early 1900s. They worked from sun up to sun down on the farm. And he could remember as a kid, his daddy and him, they would make baskets on a moonlight night. I mean, uh, that's the time they had to set aside to do that, you know. And me and Mary, one time, it probably took us about a few hours to come to the conclusion. We thought about doing it for a living, but it didn't take long. <laughs> that ain't going to happen. <laughs> uh, the main thing about it is, uh, most areas were the baskets are really popular in rural areas and people ain't, can't afford it and don't have a lot of money to buy on a basket, you know. And uh, with us, we started out making the baskets crude, but just like uh, Scott said, I'm sort of perfectionist. I wanted to do better and every basket, you know, uh, starts out with material. I do the split now. My wife does the basket making. And one other thing about like, that like fast like the person that taught us how, my wife asked him, how many baskets have you probably made? He said in the thousands. So <laughs> from day one, me and my wife started numbering our baskets. And there's a few of them, maybe a couple dozen that fell through the crack, but we probably made between 1,400 and 1,500 baskets. I've made four or five and she's made the rest. <laughs> well, one thing about it is, she convinced me that splitting out the wood was the fun part. <laughs> made the basket, anybody, anybody can make the basket. Sure. So she, she, she convinced me, and that's what you got to do to your husband. You got to convince him that splitting out that wood is easy and fun. We call it tag team basket making. Like the wrestlers, you know, you do your party, tag off, and she takes it. <laughs> and one other thing on that, and I'll turn it over to Sue's song. Some of the things that, uh, that Sue can make a piece of wood work. The first year that my wife took a basket from her class, from her, when she got through with the class, she told Sue, said, Sue, my husband would throw this in the trash can. But when she got through, <laughs> she had a basket. Wow. You're talking about nice. the material wasn't what you were used to. The you... material wasn't what I was used to, and I was throwing away. But she, she knew how precious it was, and she fine-tuned it, and that's what she'd come away with. But I think it's just like in anything else, if you start something, you want to do the very best you can. Mm -hmm. And in the very beginning, baskets were made for necessity, but then along tourism come along, and it was made to sell it, and you try to make it as pretty as you know, that you could to hope somebody would buy it. Do not know you've got something to say. <laughs> <laughs> well, in Tennessee, we break down the pole different than these two guys do. Mm -hmm. uh, Miss Gertie Youngblood was the person that taught me about baskets, and that was in the 80s. And she would tell me, you've got to scrape this. We started off with a pocket knife. I had blisters on my hands so bad by the time I got through with that class, I thought, I cannot do this. <laughs> well, they healed up, and of course I went back and did it again. She and Estel Youngblood was teaching a class in that mental, and I took that class. And then UT set up a program at the 4-H camp, and it was Heritage Skills. So they said, well, we've got quilting, we need something else. And I said, I know what else we can do. So Estel went about four years and he passed away. So I went and picked up Miss Gertie and Mary Jane Prater and took them to Crossville. And whoever, if you went to Miss Gertie or she chose you to start with, you stayed with her. And we had a lot of people that repeated classes, but if you were a Miss Gertie 
somebody that she chose, you stayed with her, and if it was Mary Jane, you stayed because they did different techniques. Their turn backs was different. There was just a different style, and they didn't want to mess up what the other one had told. Well, so that's they're passing on their tradition individually. Right. Wow. And Depression and before, Cannon County, which has got a lot of hill country, they did not have transportation, a way to make that much income from to live. You can't grow but only so much stuff on the hillside. So the women made baskets, the men made chairs, and whiskey was the other thing. That's how Cannon County existed. Well, as time went on and in the 70s, people started making baskets. It was an art. It wasn't a necessity anymore. So when it was an art, of course, you had to refine everything more. You had to make sure everything just fit perfectly. And since I'm talking, <laughs> <laughs> this right here is a Cannon County tie. Kentucky is different. And uh, the purpose of this is to hold the two hoops together so you have a place to stick your ribs. And so that's one characteristic. Now this is a little braided tie, but it's still uh, traditional <coughs> of Hart County, Kentucky, and that's Cannon County style. Yes. And notice her ribs are all the, the same size, all very small and round. I've got flatter ribs on the bottom, which again is the characteristic of Hart County, Kentucky. But they're both rib construction baskets. Right. Locally, everybody calls them egg baskets. You know, if you're gathering eggs, you, that's where you put your eggs. Well, Cannon County, if it's an egg basket, it's got a little bulge here. When you go out and put your eggs in them, they're not going to roll from one side of that basket to the other. And most of the uh, typical Hart County baskets have sort of a flat body. They did exaggerate some, but most of them were basically in this shape with a little bulge on the side. So again, that's a uh, yeah. Your eggs would roll. <laughs> now, there is a basket called the Kentucky Egg Basket, which is uh, very small as the opening. Ollie said the opening was big and large enough for a woman's hand with three eggs, but the basket flared out and it was flat on the side. It had a tall handle. So you fill that up, and supposedly some of them you put it, you fill it up with eggs to be exactly six dozen, say. You take that tall handle, put it on the saddle horn of your mule, and you could go down the mountain to trade the eggs at the store. And that's documented in Alan Eaton's book, Handy Crash of the Southern Highlands from 1937. But Ollie said, and Lester said he heard it from his mother, the exact same story. So it's, you know, got to be true, right? <laughs> So that, that's an aside, aside bar, but uh, we're back to Cannon County now. Okay, Cannon County. I've got an Appalachian smile. Oh, I don't remember that. I like that. See that little Hartwood smile? That's an Appalachian smile. Well, Miss Dirty made this style basket. Oh, the square ones. And she did make some of the others, but when it became an art, this was the style that she made and are those easier or harder to make harder I you get your <laughs> well that's what i'm saying they're very they're very hard to make yes and miss gertie was she came in once and she said you sit over here and i thought gosh i'm in trouble <laughs> well she said now you leave your chair there but you help me get everybody started when she got everybody started, she said, now you come back over here. She pulled out. The basket was started with the first 10 ribs in it. So I have a Gertie Sue basket. Mm -hmm. oh. Nobody else has a Gertie Sue basket. But that basket has always been special. And it was this style. Now, would she tell you how to do it or you just learn by watching her and she just hand it to you? I had to watch her. She didn't talk that much. Okay. You had to know if you ask a direct question, 
she probably would take your basket and and fix it. Yeah. So you, you had to be, pay, but that's how she that's how she taught. Right. And I look at that as a very traditional way, because uh, some teachers, of Leona Waddell is a friend of ours. She's 95 now, and she'll do the same thing. If you if you're at a stopping point, she says, "Give me that." Right. And she won't tell you what she's doing. That she'll hand it back to. You. And some people have problems with that. So, Billy's here. There he is. <laughs> He's worked with Leon. That's what we can talk about. And I like to tell everybody how they need to do it. And I'll watch them. And if they're not doing it right, I'll retell them. And I've got somebody right back there that I give a hard time to. But Micah just grins and goes right on. Not a problem. Uh, and I tell him he may be from Kentucky, but he's going to do Cannon County style. That's right. <laughs> he needs to learn about it. Well, I think you all explained beautifully the different ways that tradition means something within each of your baskets. You know, you can learn something from a mentor, a person that means so much to you. It could be regional traditions, right? Depending on what grows where, where you live, where you reside. And also the materials and the techniques that you use make it regional, make it local, which I think is fascinating and, and super, super cool. Um, I'm curious, and anyone can answer, with all of these different types of traditions, whether it's material, um, you know, inspirationally, um, are those traditions difficult to uphold? And if so, why? That's a good question. Uh, if you're proud of your tradition and you understand it, it's yeah. probably easy to do it because yeah. that's what you've learned, that's what you want to do. Like you were saying, even at, at the same class, a different teacher would teach individual and they weren't stepping on each other's toes doing right. that. Right. that. That's the first I've heard of that. That's really interesting because when we were learning, I was, I, was doing all, I was reading all sorts of books and just trying everything I could and kind of came up with a way, the Scott right. Gilbert way of putting together baskets. <laughs> And we've taught lots of people, but uh, a lot of times students come to the class, they want to do it their own way. And most times it's not the best way, but they, they want, you, know, you let them go, go off on the tangent. So it's, <laughs> that's kind of an off the uh, side a little bit. But everybody learns on their own way. Uh, well, they do unless I'm left in charge at night. Miss Gertie <laughs> taught the class at 5 o'clock when we had dinner. She said, you're in charge tonight we're going to our room. Well, this lady had a basket started. It was awful. I took it apart. <laughs> and I didn't get it back to where she was at. She came back in the next morning and saw her basket and she was angry. And I thought, well, it's a lot better than what it was. <laughs> well, Leona Waddell has been known to, uh, she won't let you make a bad basket if she's teaching you. She has a certain level, even if you're a beginner, your baskets have to be up to that certain level. And that's why she would take it out of your hands and fix it. I was teaching in one cl class one time, as we were doing a little a miniature Kentucky egg basket, about 10 inches tall. And the next day, the lady was struggling with hers, and I had a sample basket about the same part as hers. I said, here, you take this one, I'll take yours. And so she went home with my basket that she finished, and she was happy, and I, I was happy too. <laughs> Anyway, this lady went running up to Miss Gertie when she walked in the door the next morning, and she said, can you believe Sue took my basket apart last night? Miss Gertie looked at her. If it needed it, she did the right thing. Well, I, I mean, what could the lady say? <laughs> yes. But at the end of the class, she came back and thanked me. She said, my basket is a really nice basket. I am proud of it. But it took her, this was the first basket she'd made like that. It, mm -hmm. She had to see, you know, if you start it wrong and it's all messed up, you can't fix it yeah. unless you take it out and redo. And uh, if you're not familiar with the, the white oak basket making, uh, you're in control of every piece you put in there. If it's too thick, you will it more. If it's uh, too thin, you've gone too far. And so you learn what it takes to make a rib, what it makes it takes to make a handle, what it takes... Your, your splits at the beginning are a little bitty. They get a little thicker as you get toward the middle. So you have to learn. But you're in control of every step. You, you can't blame the material. Right. Because you, you fix it. And that's part of the, the, the practice. As, uh, 
you got you got your material. You got to learn what you got to do. Even when I start a basket, I do wrong, <laughs> and you back up and fix what you're doing and move forward. One thing when we was uh, teaching a class up to the right and last is. Uh, and it always goes back to where the material's got to be right. They would come to me and say, Bill, is this material thin enough? I said, I'll pass it over to Mary. And, and nine out of ten times she said, it's not thin enough. If the material is not prepared right, you're not going to get a good basket. But I, uh, one thing that was sort of unique where we learned how to make a basket was in Alabama. Most basket makers make one style of baskets and uh, I've had basket makers egg baskets round baskets what it, the guy that taught us he can make any kind it didn't matter if it was a fish trap basket it was five foot tall or a cotton basket a corn basket whatever he made all kinds now his baskets weren't as neat and pretty as a lot of people but we in a, in a way got a, a, a bigger picture of it because we learned how to make all different styles. And, uh, but a lot of people don't, they just teach one style. And, but uh, this guy here, he told us how you could uh, a, a, a fish trap basket, a cotton basket, a, a, a egg basket. A, he, his egg baskets were crude. I'm gonna tell you one more story and I'll let it go to somebody else. Keep going. Uh, <laughs> One time we took some of uh, his baskets to North Carolina on a vacation and was trying to sell a few baskets for myself and him and uh, one of uh, my oldest friends, which was my daddy's uh, uh, good friends. And so I carried her an egg basket and she fell in love with that egg basket. And I told her what the price would be and she said, I can't afford that. So uh, I went back to the guy and I said, uh, that time, uh, probably about seventy-five or hundred dollars is what he charged for an egg basket. I said, I got an old friend at home. She wants an egg basket. Can you make one for thirty-five dollars? He said, Yeah. So the next year, I carried her that egg basket, and the first thing she said, she said, Don't tell anybody I paid this much money for that basket. <laughs> and I, told, I turned around and told her, I said. That's right. You don't let nobody know that you didn't pay but thirty-five dollars. <laughs> how you want to look at it, you know. But uh, uh, there's a few times in selling baskets, I, I really felt like giving the basket to the person. We had a woman came to our one of our. It was like a old timers day or whatever, and she kept coming all day long, picking that basket up and looking at it. And, and she'd shake her head and walk away and, and, and she kept saying, I'd love to have that basket because she didn't like to go to farmer's markets and put things in that basket. But finally, uh, she couldn't afford it, but she finally came back and bought it because that was something that was in her family, had been in her family, that they had a type of basket like that. And it was a sacrifice for her to buy that basket. And the only reason I didn't give it to her, I didn't want to hurt her feelings. <laughs> you know, that would have sort of hurt her feelings if I'd have done that, you know. Yeah. But, uh, but, the, but the thing about it was when you're starting out, and I think one of the things is going to be about how you sell your stuff. When we first started out in the spring and the fall, there would be four, five, six, just about every weekend you can go to a festival, can't you? in the spring and the fall. And uh, that's where we learned to take hours. And uh, we learned real fast, like after a few years, they would ask you, somebody that really buys them, make something different. You know, they wanted, they wanted a different variety because they didn't want the same thing all the time. But that's a good place to, to start out making baskets or anything like that. Find out craft shows and things like that, and that'll get you started. Well, in the traditional way, because like I said, in Cannon County, you went to town once a week or once a month on your mule or horse. The brokers got into it right. in the 30s and 40s, 
And they would go around and buy baskets from all the local basket makers. And there was hundreds of families in Cannon County. Yes. And even in the 50s. And they got 10, 15 cents for a basket that yeah. they had put together. And then the broker would triple or quadruple the price. But and, and he had to go north to sell, so, you yeah. know, well, he I, did have experience. Oh, yeah. And uh, <laughs> the children's family, they would load up a wagon. And one of the family members would go up, they said four states or five states up through Ohio and Indiana. Then some family members would be making baskets home, put them on a rail car that sell out of all these other. Mm -hmm. And they would go to country stores and sell these mostly, or on the side of the road. And they'd pick up the new baskets at the rail stop and come back through Missouri and make the rounds. Oh. So that they, and then finally that, there's pictures of the wagon and the archives, there's pictures of a truck. And they put these big stobs on the back of the truck and just hang these egg baskets, just hang them on them. And mm. that's how they transport them. Well, in Cannon County, because they made chairs, they hung chairs on the side of the truck and all those baskets was piled in the middle and yeah. those chairs, the backs of them that went up. And I, the I think there's pictures in the archives that mm -hmm. high as you can get those yes. things. The one good thing about Cannon County baskets uh, since the late 70s and 80s, a lot of the basket makers, who most of them are gone now, were documented by the state. Was it Roby Cogswell, the state folklorist, yes, came in? In the 70s, it became an arc. Before that, they made baskets that they used on the farm. Yeah, or sell, sold to a neighbor or something. And I'm going to show one more and tell about this. Oh. I redid this one, but it was made, it was a garden basket. That's not a typical shape that you find. No, but this is Cannon County and it was a garden basket. Well, this guy came in at the Cannon County Center and he was holding these two baskets and he said, what do you think about these? And I looked at them and I said, well, that one's in bad shape. Well, he told me in advance he gave $10 for this basket. Well, now it's in good shape but the dark ribs i kept every original thing i could and i had some old weavers i glued places to where the rim was broken so now this is worth more than ten dollars <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's that's but a, i mean it was antique. just shreds where the weavers just was falling apart now how do you when I'm taking old baskets, I take them out in the yard and hose them down to get rid of all the chicken manure in them. I took it apart. You just took the whole thing apart. And washed everything and then kept everything that could go back in it. And you didn't really number everything. You just kind of no, remembered just, where they were going right, to go. Right. I knew the shape. So yeah. I was... Oh, that's precious. And, yeah, and I love the fact you got the older splits because it gives them that an older right, look to it. Right. And see where that was patched. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. It's so thick there, from there to there, it was broken. And you can see uh, oh, right. down in here the, the stain from the iron nails. Right. A lot of times, the only thing, people say, I don't want to see nails on my baskets. But a lot of times on the old baskets, the only thing holding them together right. is yes. the nail. Right. But anyway. Can you show the inside to oh, the sure. audience? It's, beautiful it's gorgeous. In uh, the chemistry lesson, the iron uh, reacts with the tannic acid in the white oak and forms a natural dye called iron tannate. And that's what those dark stains are. And I had a lady from Murfreesboro saw another version, but I got it from this, the new version from this basket. And she said, oh, I want an herb basket. I don't want one that deep. Will you have one ready for next year? And I said, well, maybe. Well, her husband kept checking all during the year. We got the basket started. Well, I did get it finished, and I had set it back for people just to look at. When they came in, she knew that was her basket. Oh, wow. So, you know, it was a garden basket. Well, uh, do you find that the names are regional? Like, if, you know, if that was made in Kentucky, I wonder what it would be called. I have no idea. I don't either. Uh, have you not seen one in Kentucky made like this? Well, uh, uh, stuff very similar, but not, not exactly like that. That's a very unique basket. That, you know, of course, we've seen thousands of... Ollie and Lestal said they had over 50 different types of baskets they would make, mostly rib construction. Right. But that's a, that's a neat design. 
Uh, there's a story in Don Rice Irwin's book, Appalachian Baskets. Mm -hmm. uh, Don Rice has uh, the Museum of Appalachia up north of uh, Norris, Tennessee, north of uh, Knoxville. And so he heard about an asparagus basket. So he finally tracked the lady down. She went out to the barn, brought with just a normal basket. And he's kind of disappointed. He said, I thought we were looking at an asparagus basket. She said, yeah, every spring I'd go out with this basket and gather my asparagus. That's <laughs> right. So the names are, can be anything you want to, basically. Right, depending on what you had that you was going to be gathering and you needed a basket to do that. So mm -hmm. you made the style that you wanted. Well, and the cotton baskets in Alabama were well, they were really big because you get a lot of cotton in them and cotton doesn't weigh much. So they were big baskets. And I guess you'd drag them through the fields. That's no, you didn't. What they drew, what they done? And they drug a bag. They, they took a burlap sack and the, filled the sack up, drag it through, and then come back and empty the sack in the basket and then it rut. Yeah, because they're usually about a two or three bushel basket. They were round. They would hold roughly. They, they claim a hundred pounds of cotton. Mm. Okay, so the basket was sturdy enough, even though you're not carrying rocks. But a hundred pounds is still a hundred pounds. At, at ones I've seen have big, thick, heavy rims. Did they have handles or just a cutout? Well, it all depends on part of the country. Most, the, most of them had handhelds. But we made four baskets for this museum in Arkansas, and they had the handheld handle on the side, which is up above. Okay. But I thought that wasn't very practical because it'd get knocked off real easy. Right. But, uh, but they wanted it like that. I'm going to give you an example of price. Uh, this was probably about 15, 20 years, 15 years ago. We had a uh, corn basket, and uh, a corn basket was originally made to hold a bushel of corn in the shop. Well, we had that corn basket up there, and we had it for sale for $100. And uh, these two old men came by, about the same age I am right now. And, uh, they were old to you, though. They were old. <laughs> and uh, they, they shook their head and said, well, if I told them it was $100, they shook their head. I, I can't believe that. said, we used to sell those things all day long for 50 cents a piece. Right. And they were, they were tr being truthful. And I said, you're exactly right. I said, the price hasn't gone up. I said, how long did it take back then to make that basket? Right. Two days. It still take two days. Can you get somebody to work for fifty dollars a day today? He said the price ain't gone up. So it's all price is irrelevant to the time, you know. But uh, uh, well, as a as a producing craft per person, if you're turning wood or a potter, and you, you want to make a living doing that, you have to make production. Ali and Lessel can make about two and a half baskets a day, starting from scratch every morning. And they were these were egg baskets. Now, if you're doing a whole bushel basket, that might take more than one day, but they could do a couple peck baskets or a gallon basket, two or three a day. It's just amazing. Well, the rim on a, on a cotton basket is uh, 88 inches. And that, and, see, they, that's mm, almost seven feet tall. That's, just, no, that's the rim. I know, yeah, but that's yeah, how yeah. tall the tree yeah, is. Yeah, the, tree you got to split that out. But, uh, you know, but, and, and back then, like you say, they were crude. You know, they didn't, they didn't care what it looked like because they didn't make them for being pretty, they made them to be functional. Mm -hmm. And when we first started making baskets, that's what my wife wanted. She wanted a basket that she could use. She takes the, one of the best egg baskets like that she's made, and she uses it every, every week we use in the garden and things like that. It doesn't care if it's got a grass stain in it. Well, most people made a basket like that, they're going to set it up on the shelf, ain't they? They don't want to use it. <laughs> but we, we made them originally to work with, you know. Oh, we've worn out baskets. We got some children's baskets. We'd take them in the car and yeah. push the chair back and crush the handles. I mean, <laughs> we've worn out lots of baskets, but they're made to be used. One other thing about the best way to, to uh, restore a basket or keep it in in a good condition is about once a year just take it hose it down out in the yard and hang it up or not out in the bright sunlight but hang it up in the shade and let it dry because literally what it does it puts the life back in that wood don't it you know even though it's dried it just renews that piece of wood but, but, and, but if, if you soaked it overnight or a couple of days it's all going to swell up and it'll dry looser yeah but a little bit of moisture doesn't hurt it a bit. No, it doesn't hurt. It gets all the sand. And, you know, even though your house is shut up, it's got, 
it's going to be in a year or two years time there's going to be dust in it and things like that so the best thing to do is is wash it down like every year or two now have you ever taken an old dusty basket and an air compressor and you hose it off and all that comes right back in your face <laughs> don't ask me how i know that <laughs> Well, I think jumping off of all of these tips and tricks and techniques and traditional techniques, right, uh, of this basket making that you all have garnered over the years, I have one final big question for all three of you, and then we can turn it over to audience members if anybody has any questions. I'm curious, just a big general question, why is tradition so necessary for these baskets? Uh, well, that's a, that's a broad question. It is. Uh, traditions, <laughs> uh, as a culture, are important. And it depends on how you grew up, and every culture has its own ways of looking at things. That doesn't make it right or wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, all cultures are equal in value, as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, sticking with the tradition, one thing, uh, you, you can't always do new, new, new. Uh, but you, so you learn something, you get good at it, and you want to you want to show it off, you want to continue that. So that's right. one reason right. to keep the tradition, uh, in, my, in my case, to keep it, keep it going. Yeah, great answer. Sue? I want to keep the tradition going. Miss Gertie would turn over in her grave if <laughs> she thought I was not keeping her style. And the first few classes I took with her, she told me I had basket making in my blood. And I thought, how do you know that? I don't think so. I found out later I did have. So I guess, you know, I just want to keep the style that she did, try to make it as nice as I can. Keep her alive. When you're passing that tradition on through teaching Gertie's style of basket in classes. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's what I do. And uh, I don't know, but uh, there's not that many basket makers left in Cannon County. I am the only one that is teaching any classes in Middle Tennessee. That would then add that out of hundreds and hundreds of basket makers. Oh, yes. 40 years ago. Yes. Yeah. Well, the same thing's happening in Hart County. And there's one other person that makes some baskets, but she only shows her grandkids. She don't show anybody else, and they sell everything that they make. Okay, so that's it's still continuing in that sense, so. Right. Wow. Well, how about you, Bill? I think about tradition just about like this telephone. That's the reason I pulled this telephone out. Not to see what time it is. <laughs> but, uh, the young generation today couldn't live without this telephone, could they? Yeah. You know? And tradition to me is things that we're talking about these baskets. If we don't keep the thing alive, it won't be long. People won't know what, what that basket is, you know. And it's, it's not important to a sense, but it is in a way, you know. And, <clears throat> and, I, and I believe Kentucky and Tennessee and Alabama, where we was at, learned how to do it to start with, uh, the Alabama folk, the Alabama Arts and Council, uh, they realize how important tradition is. And uh, they had an apprenticeship program just like you did. We started out in 18, 1988, and in 88 and 99, Alabama uh, Arts and Council would give a grant to people that were willing to work under a mentor, you know, somebody that would show them how. And uh, we was lucky enough to find somebody and for two years, the Alabama Arts and Council gave us a $1,500 grant just so we would help keep the tradition alive. Right. And, and, and uh, that's way, you know, and, and Sue's done the same thing. Right. right. In Tennessee, we had the Traditional Arts Appreciation Program. And I was one of the first ones when they started the program. It was... I kept telling them every year, just one more person. I've got this person from Cannon County. I've got this person just down the road. Well, finally that fourth year, I said, I absolutely will not ask you to let me do this again. 
it was my nephew the last year. So I, and Michelle was my apprentice one year. So mm -hmm. it, uh, it was very nice. Yeah, and Kentucky has done the same thing. Beth worked with all, with Lestal Childress. And uh, you basically got gas money and he got, you know, a little bit more money. But you went up there about six months, I think. Yeah. And she came back with this big, tall Kentucky egg basket, just stunning. Oh. And uh, mm -hmm. I keep my eye on that thing. One of these days I'm gonna make one. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've got a huge basket that's about that big around. And its name is Big Bertha. For Bertha. And Big Bertha, that's a one and done. I'll never make oh, that. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, we've probably seen Big Bertha, I, I think, you at did. your house. Yeah. 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 I even use tiny weavers, and why, I do not know. Yeah. Yeah. Big well, Bertha uh, is... Well, one thing about Big Bertha, as a basket collector in uh, Hart County, Kentucky, Dr. Middleton at the mm -hmm. Family Medical Clinic, he's got hundreds of locally made baskets uh, well, 90% of them are locally, some of them came from other states, uh, in his uh, medical clinic there. Mm -hmm. And Mark Childress made about an eight bushel, his version of Big Bertha. And the kids crawl in it and play in it. Oh. <laughs> so, and uh, John, John Rice Irwin's museum, he's got another big bushel basket mm -hmm. that a family made. Uh, except Mark Childress's is, is a, a better shape to it. The one that uh, John Rice Irwin's kind of pull down because as you tighten those weavers it pull right. down the outside right. but yeah it's uh probably one and done on the, right. the big basket <laughs> i think uh we need to be thankful for like the kentucky art thing here and other places in, in alabama this apprenticeship program run off about four or five years and they had a, a big getting together one time and, they had 34 different crafts, I think it was. It wasn't just basket making. It was uh, singing. It was pottery. It was all different things like that of the, of the past. I mean, and if we don't, if we don't make an effort to keep it going, 10 or 15, 20 years, you, you know, all those things will be a thing of the past. So we need to give, uh, be thankful for the different states that's willing to promote that. Well, yeah, and you don't want to just see a basket at a museum. It's a, it's a living, breathing craft made by living, breathing people and to keep the tradition going. And if you're sitting somewhere uh, and somebody can come up and talk to you about it, that goes a long way. A uh, hundred times better than just looking at an item in a dusty museum. So. I want to say one more thing too. We probably talked about, we probably had a, roughly 200 students in our teaching. <coughs> but. <laughs> uh, Mary always sounds very emotional, but the friends that you meet in, the, in that area, you know, mm -hmm. it's just unbelievable. We've got lifetime friends. We've got friends that we met from all part of the United States, you know, and that means a lot, you know, that you should have something in common and, and uh, just like we come here and him with Beth and them. And, they go back to uh, North Carolina, Alabama, spend with us, and all different ones. Though it's just a a, a good feeling that in friendship that you can arrive from from that and younger generation, with you know uh, Emily and things like that, which you'll hear a little bit later on. You know, it's it's, it's good that we can have that friendship and, and work together. Mm -hmm. It means a, it means more because I just take everything for granted. But you look back and go, gee. This is pretty cool. <laughs> and I think it's very interesting how, Bill, you mentioned, you know, at beginnings, uh, baskets were just for utilitarian purposes, right? Getting mm -hmm. things from point A to point B. Survival in a sense. Mm -hmm. And I think it's beautiful that you all have transcended this art and it's still survival. It's emotional survival. It's traditional survival. You know, the friends you make, the traditions you make, it's necessary and it's beautiful and we can all benefit from the wonderful work that you all do. Um, Instead of being a local community, it's a turn into a global community. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. That's a good thing. Well, we'd love to turn it over for a couple questions. We have about five minutes for anybody who would love to ask anything at all. <laughs> yes, over here. I'm the, I'm over by you. I'm on the crack of Grayson County and Hart County. Oh, okay. Uh, there by the river. Um, with the way things are going now, do you see the good possibility of the need for the baskets and the older 
arts and the older traditions and the older ways of doing things of having to come back with the with us potentially not being able to get things from other countries that we would normally get, uh, be it uh, politically or because they've gotten themselves in a bind or we've gotten ourselves in a bind. Well, uh, the, these baskets that we're talking about are all local. When Beth and I were starting baskets, we'd go to, we met, like you mentioned, every county had a basket maker. And uh, so it's, it's all local. And now, traditionally, growing up in the 50s, all the baskets we considered inexpensive baskets you'd, you'd find at the local markets were coming from Czechoslovakia and, Euro and Europe. Well, that switched over to Japan and now it switched over to China. But you don't buy baskets to use from China at Hobby Lobby. All that Chinese stuff is it's it's pretty, but it's you know it's not it's not not the same thing. You got to you know grab a piece of plastic and carry things in. So uh, I don't. Know, I think the tradition is continuing on a local level, and it'll probably stay that way. But it's not really competing with what's coming in from overseas. Does that answer the question? Or I'm thinking more along the lines of if we stop getting those things from overseas. Oh, uh, would it pick up more here? Uh, that's a possibility. There's also, uh, we import reed from Hong Kong, which comes from Indonesia and Vietnam, and that's, they've been importing reed for 200 years from overseas. And most basket makers now use the imported reed material, which is all different shapes and sizes, to make their baskets. So they're being taught all over the whole country, but 90 or 95% of the basket makers now use the imported materials. And if that quits, okay, you might have to, you know, they make paper splints you can make baskets out of. You can start learning how to do willow baskets, which is a traditional material. So I think maybe some of that traditional material would come back if all of a sudden the reed supply stopped. Because people you know, have a need to work with their hands and make things. And it almost did stop a couple of years ago, especially with COVID. It was hard to get reed in from overseas. <laughs> One other thing, and we started out with the reed. But after you uh, make a basket out of white oak, you become a white oak snob. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason why is the basket's made out of the cane. You put five pounds in them, you're going to be holding about a hammer. You know? But the white oak basket is designed to hold whatever you can put in it. If it's, if it's small or whatever, it's designed, that handle, that structure, that basket, is made to handle whatever weight you can put in that basket. That, and uh, we we always joked about that. It ain't, you know, we don't have nothing against uh, making a basket out of reed, because that's how we start thinking about. But uh, after you get to the white oak, it's a different level. Yeah. And, and you started off this way. White oak is the basket material of choice in Tennessee and Kentucky and Alabama and the Appalachians. You get up in, in Maine and Canada, you get the black ash. Yeah. The Shakers up in Sabbath Day Lake uh, went made 77,000 baskets in their 20 or 40, 50 year career out of black ash. The one to South Union, the other Shaker village here in Kentucky, their baskets are made out of white oak because it's local. You go out to California, you get western cedar bark, or you get bear grass baskets, or you get uh, uh, oak leaf sumac baskets, which are the Navajo wedding, wedding tray. So it, baskets are always local. Whatever. Whatever it, material is locally for that area. Some know. people figured it out tens of thousands of years ago how to do that. And we're just keep, we're keeping that tradition going. <laughs> well, we have time for one more question. Anybody would like to ask one? Yes, of course. Hi. Um, I was wondering if there's anybody in, say, this area teaching basketry or anything like that. Uh, in Kentucky, there's a... Uh, Kentucky Basket Association, KBA, there's a Bluegrass Basket Association. Uh, Beth and I teach occasionally, we're over in Allen County. We, uh, we talk about Hart County, we live in Allen County. And so every now and then, we used to teach a lot, but as we're getting older, we're not teaching near as much. But our people, you can check with the local extension office, our local arts council. We just did a basket class in Butler County for their local arts council. One, because they asked us to, and they're friends. So. Yeah. So, yeah. We have a gill in oh. um, Owensboro and Ohio County. Yeah, so that's Vicki Hass. She's okay. living in Ohio County, so she might be a good resource for, yeah. for this area. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, really quick. One last question. Yes. What about the materials used by the Native Americans? Well, again, they use whatever is local. Uh, 
the Cherokee in North Carolina used to use all river cane. Uh, when Wilson's honeysuckle spread into the area by the 1880s, they were using what we call Japanese honeysuckle. Then somewhere they, they switched over. Here's river cane. Emily's got two. These are you, relatively new. Water. And you split the, it's, a, now cane's not like bamboo. Cane's a slow growing grass. But you know, you had cane breaks you couldn't drive a horse through. So you split it and make it, then somewhere they started doing a lot more white oak because the river cane was harder to find. Uh, and it's hard to split too. Yeah, you know, they said it'll cut it's you up. Uh, the Navajo wading trays uh, that you get out in Arizona and Utah are made up with a scanning process of an oak leaf sumac. You take the, the, the every time you cut the tree back, it, the bush, it, it sprouts out more. You take each one of those withs or whatever you want. You split them in three pieces. You scrape out the stomach, get the bark off. You got this long, thin, the inner piece. That's the hardest, the toughest part of the, the sumac. And then you can trim it with scissors or trim it with your knife or people would get uh, uh, baking powder tins and punch holes with a screwdriver and you can pull it through that to get your, that's the threads. Then you get three or four or five or seven foundations of little bitty sumacs and you start that coiling process. And each previous new row gets stitched to the previous row. Then you get all the patterns. And in the Navajo ceremonial trays, let's call them, it's not really a wedding tray, there's always a pathway going out from the center where there's no decoration. And it, that's where you terminate your basket. And if you're doing a ceremony where you've got to get up at dawn, uh, this is a female puberty ceremony, and you got the corn pollen in there, you get up at dawn and that part that's sticking out, you walk east with your friends behind you, and that's part of the ceremony. And that's a, a new basket. You've got to have a brand new basket to do that ceremony. And uh, from what we understand, it's not, uh, you don't have to do it, if, but if you want to, it's a very traditional thing to do if you're a Navajo living on the res. So that, and out west, you have western red cedar bark. And they, they could harvest uh, half, the, well, a third of the bark off the tree. It wouldn't kill the tree. Now, it wouldn't be good for lumber anymore, but you could peel off, and that's what they made all their baskets out of out there. So it's all, it's all regional. Does that answer the question? One thing there in the eastern part of the United States, there's a, a, a book about the Indians, and you can tell what period of time, how far back it went, the Indians made baskets basically out of three different materials. The white man taught the Indians how to make the baskets out of white oak. They didn't come up with that. You know? And so you can literally tell what they were using to tell what period of time basically those Indians were living in, you know, that period of time. You know? Yeah, and we've seen uh, old uh, uh, the oak leaf sumac baskets in museums that are 2,000 years old and they were made identical to what uh, Navajo and the Utes are making today. It's just amazing how that tradition has carried on. Do you ever run any, uh, cross head or any of the Pomo baskets? Uh, I've seen some at museums and I'm not sure, uh, they had a slightly different technique and different grasses. It wasn't a sumac. Uh, it, it seemed like somewhere I just read an article about that. Uh, so all this is documented. Everything's on the web now. You know, Promo from the tribe out there. Oh, okay. Be interesting to, to do some checking up and uh, right. see if you can do some research and see what they've made. Uh, there might be a substitute material here. It's not going to be the same thing because it's completely different. Uh, they were in Arizona, is that right? Or New Mexico? No, they're oh, California. Northern, they're northern California. My wife's home. Oh, okay. Oh. Yeah. There's another one here? Uh, well, she's not here. She's at, she's at home. She's sleeping. She works yeah. tonight. What were they, grass baskets or bark uh, baskets? They or? used sweet grass, they used uh, pine needles, they used uh, my wife's great aunt's, uh, her baskets are in the Smithsonian. They, uh, they were pine needle and hummingbird feathers. Uh, oh, so, oh yeah. I've, seen, uh, I've seen some, I think I can picture them. They're unbelievably beautiful and desirable as far as contemporary baskets or antique baskets. Too. Yeah. Wow. So they're in museums out there, those baskets are in. The, there's a museum in Northern California where they have a, a room probably about as big as this where there's nothing but baskets from the tribe, from the local tribes that have been curated and collected. And uh, it's the, it's in the Redwoods. I want to say it's, I can't think of the name. My wife would be able to tell you because she 
goes there. He used to go there all the time. Yeah. We lived in Northern California up until about six years ago. And see, that's just totally foreign to us because I've never been out there. That's all be all brand new, and then to you, it's just local. Yeah. And just like White Oak being local to us here. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Well, let's give a wonderful round of applause. <laughs>